Well, hello, everyone. I'm Reverend Carla. Welcome to Spirituality Matters, a podcast that focuses on the intersection of spirituality and humanity. And now I invite you to this sacred space between here where I am and there where you are. And let us be reminded that the Holy transcends our physical bodies and our time together is just as sacred and meaningful as if we were sitting beside one another. All right, let's get started. The title of this podcast is It Didn't Have to Be This Way. This podcast is inspired by my blog by the same name that you can find at numasoul.com. Now, this has to do with what it means to be an empath. And in a few minutes, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But I just want to start out by saying that we are all empaths. It's not something that is about being rare It's about being connected, whether or not we have turned away from this innate gift that we all have. So I want to put that at the very beginning as our first marker on what we're going to talk about today. But what that often means for someone like I am, and I think there's a lot of us out here that are like this, that that feel the heaviness of the world. It's, it just feels heavy. And that often makes feelings feel big and overwhelming and leave you feeling hopeless. And I write about that often in my journal that I don't share with anybody else. Every once in a while, there's something that profoundly that arises that I might share on social media. But for the most part, that's just between me and the holy. But the other day I wrote, feeling the pain of the world all of the time is so heavy. Because I don't think there is a time where I haven't, even, even as a little girl, I can remember, remember feeling that I don't know that, that, uh, people talk about, well, you know, maybe you need to do some more (laughs) kind of relaxation exercises. I do, I do restorative practices and I do try to balance myself, but I don't know if it's necessarily something that I want to get rid of. I think it has guided me in some of the choices that I've made. And I'm happy about that. My work in animal welfare up to where we are now in this ministry. So throughout the years, there have been images in my mind that have stuck with me, whether it's the starving children or the animals that are abused or how we are annihilating uh, our environment and things like that. But I can think about specific movies now and get emotional and one of those that I write about in the blog is the killing killing fields. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute, not in great detail, but a little bit um, about prim- primatologist Diane Fossey and the work that she did with um, the gorillas and the story of Emmett Till and his, his murder. So those are things that still haunt me uh, today when I think about how we can take things that happen that are so tragic in humanity's um, story and turn them for the good. You can't stop the fact that they happened, but how can we take that and make it something to ensure that that won't happen again? So um, I'm going to promise you as best I can that this podcast won't be very graphic. I try not to do that here because I know that You might be listening in your car. I get your, I, I see your messages. I hear what this means to you. And I so appreciate to that you, this podcast helps you process those things in your life, just as I am, because a lot of times that's what these, these are. These stories are helping me still on my healing journey from healing from religious trauma and deconstructing my faith and trying to figure out how I fit into this world and what what I can continue to help, how, what, what healing balm I can offer. And oftentimes that means just to pause and be contemplative and be, and pay attention to that, which breaks your heart, that which causes you pain. And that points you to where your activism lies. And that absolutely intersects with your spirituality. We talk about that quite a bit. So for those of you who don't know, uh, the movie, The Killing Killing Fields, um, it is from 1984. So some of you might not even 
be born at that time. My daughter would have been only five years old when this movie was, uh, when this movie was made, but it tells the story of the Cambodian genocide under the Khmer Rouge of the 1970s. So the Khmer Rouge was a communist regime that ruled Cambodia, Cambodia from 1975 to 1979. And it was led by Pol Pot. Now, P-O-L-P-O-T, if you don't know this story, this is a wonderful time to go spend some time in a history book or even just in on the internet to learn more about the Khmer Rouge because they wanted to create this kind of, well, what they, what they proposed was like this type of utopia by forcing urban populations to work in the countryside. So in other words, they said, that this type of life, this advancement in technology is not working. We need to be all, all go out and work along the countrysides. But what ended up happening is this led to huge uh, widespread famine and death because making, forcing people to live in places where they didn't belong and forcing that through intimidation, abuse, execution, mass executions, torture, all these things that they did was horrific. And it's estimated that around 1.7 million people died during their, um, during their reign, during their terror, terror uh, reign that they had. That was about a quarter of a population of Cambodia. So you can imagine the horrific impact the Khmer Rouge on ha the people of Cambodia at that time. So it was an extremist ideology. They had no regard for human life and they used uh, brutal tactics. That's their legacy. That's, that's the truth of what happened. So this story in the killing fields is about this American journalist uh, whose name was Sidney Shanberg. And he had a Cam Cambodian interpreter who traveled with him, Dith Pran, and they became separated during the aftermath of the Khmer Rouge takeover of Phnom Penh. So the Khmer Rouge is just taking over. They get separated. Now, Schoenberg manages to escape from Cambodia, but Pran is left behind and endures years of forced labor and other atrocities at the hands of the Khmer Rouge. Eventually, Schomburg learns of Pran, uh, where Pran is and works to secure his release. And this leads to an emotional reunion. Now, I'm not going to tell you everything that happens in this movie, because if you have not seen it, it is worth watching. But I will tell you, don't think you're going to watch it while you're cooking supper or anything like that. Give this movie um, the attention it deserves. Because there are certain scenes I can just see like as if it was yesterday. I've only watched it once. I'm not sure I could go watch it again. And I, I watched that when it first came out. So in the eighties, I was in my twenties and that's what kind of impact it had on me. Now the story of Diane Fossey, and there's also a movie. I'm not sure I actually wrote about her movie. Uh, there is a movie about her as well that tells her story that Sigourney Weaver plays Diane Fossey. So it's a wonderful movie as well. But she was an American zoologist and she dedicated her life to studying uh, the mountain gorillas in Rwanda because they are endangered. And she was trying to work with the local people to find a way to protect them. So she arrived in 19... Uh, 67 at this research center that was up in the Virunga mountains. And she was there to study their behavior and their social structure. Um, but she was also very much a part of creating systems to address poaching because that was one of the biggest threats to the mountain gorilla. So she worked with the Rwandan government to establish the first natural national park to protect the mountain gorillas and her groundbreaking research and advocacy was one of the reasons that people all around the world began to understand how fragile of an ecosystem that the mountain gorillas lived in and how important it was to not only pre uh, pr uh, protect them, but also the ecosystem that was around them. So it was all very much um, uh, important to her and it gained international support. Well, 
that kind of notoriety also got the attention of those who were threatened by their work, specifically those who were not afraid to use violence to be able to get to the guerrillas any way they can because of what they wanted to do with them for the uh, for the incredibly illegal and highly unethical and inhumane practice of poaching those animals because it's a, it's a it's a horrific reality that people will pay top dollar to consume gorilla meat and so you're dealing with a lot of sordid humans around the world who were paying these poachers thousands of dollars to try to get to these gorillas. Well, what ended up happening is she was killed, murdered one night in one of the, her cabins at the research center at the, uh, in the mountains of Arunga. And her murder has never been solved, but we can imagine what happened now since then, which is when you think again about tragedy and then moving on to how something good can come out of it, her life ended, but what ended up happening is there was a fund established in her name called the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund International. And through that work, her work continues even up to today to protect the mountain gorilla. So guess what? The mountain gorilla, the work that started in the 60s, thanks to Diane Fossey, continues to carry on to today. Now, I won't get into a lot of the detail about Emmett Till because if you haven't seen the movie, there's all kinds of stuff out there, but it's very graphic and horrific. What happened to him is a 14 year old, um, as a, as a black child, he was 14 years old. He was br brutally mur murdered in Mississippi in 1955, where he had gone there to visit with family and a white woman accused him of whistling at him, which of course he did not. And her story was inconsistent. It changed several times, but the problem was they knew who killed him and they knew that he, they wouldn't, that they would be acquitted in the very white Southern part of this Mississippi. And that's exactly what happened. And that also grew um, outrage across the country when those men were acquitted. Now, also, one of the things that made Emmett Till's murder so horrific and garnered the national attention was his mother, Mamie's decision to hold the open casket because there was no hiding behind makeup what a brutal attack her son had endured. So this wasn't just something where it was over. He had endured great torture before he had been killed. 14 years old. So that story still continues up until today. And I remember re when I first read about that, how incredibly heartbroken I was that someone's life at such a young age was taken at them by men who, regardless of their color, should have been his protector. But that's how, that's how unsafe it is for uh, black people in the South, especially in the fifties before civil rights and, and because civil, civil rights issues will be starting this, this, this civil unrest because the black people were so disgustingly tired, justifiably so of being so oppressed in the South. Now, I also wrote in the blog a little bit about the trail of tears, which um, many of us have heard about, but don't know the story about the trail of death. So the Trail of Tears is where, uh, through the Re Indian Relocation Act, um, I, actually it's called the Indian Removal Act of 1830, this is where the government gave themselves permission to forci forcibly relocate indigenous peoples from their ancestral lands all across the United States. And many times they were deceived into doing that. If you've never read about President Jackson's um, culpability in that, you really need to read it because he's an absolutely horrible person for what he did to the uh, American Indians. So the Trail of Tears where thousands of uh, Indians died 
on these marches, but the trail of death was also just as brutal. It, it began in Indiana and went on. And most of that was for, with the Potawatomi Indians that were native to Indiana and were forced to areas around Kansas and th through a time where it was the dead of winter no rations for food, no accommodations for women and children, even if the women were pregnant at the time, nothing. So it was very brutal. And when I read those stories, and a lot of times, you know, I don't remember hearing those in great detail in my um, in my history books. A lot of times we saw those pictures of, of uh, indigenous people smiling and in their traditional garb using hand gestures as if to say, sure, we're welcoming you into our land as if it was a, such, it's such a mutual agreement that there was no violence around it, but that certainly wasn't the case. So the trail of uh, death ended up being the largest forced um, removal of native Indians from Indiana. And that stuck with me because that's where I lived most of my life. And I think about these sacred lands and who really belongs here. So why does this st kind of stuff keep me up at night? And trust me when I say that I've been told more than once that I just need to lighten up. I, I get that. I, I know that I just need to lighten up because I can take a conversation pretty deep at any time, but that's where I spend my time. And that's where I find solace. It's not that I necessarily want to be the downer of any conversation it's where i it's where i live and it it feels good to be able to process this information in a way with people who feel the same as i do but i can also understand that why over the years i haven't been invited to parties or to just go out to different places because i am oh a, a word that i just one of my dear friends on uh, tiktok just said i'm profound and I had to go look that up and say, profound, deep thinker, thinking deeply about things. And I'm like, I needed that word about me. Thank you. Thank you for giving me my word that I needed to be able to explain something about who I am. Because I don't know that I necessarily want to lighten up. I can hold the balance between the tension of this world and the blessings and who I am in my life, I can find that balance between the pain where the world, the earth and the and its inhabitants are inviting me into the conversation to be a part of healing it and the joys I can experience in my life. I don't, both can be true. And sure, over the years, I might wobble a little bit back and forth, but for the most part, when I can hold that balance, I find myself to be the most at a place of serenity that I serve this, this momentum to move forward by writing and encouraging people and show them how they can live a life free from some of those indoctrinated beliefs and also contribute to some of the pain in the world by working in animal welfare and things like that, like I have done over the years, but also understand that it's okay to pause and be human for a moment. It's okay to take a rest. It's okay to live a life filled with joy. Just what's your part in being part of that healing bomb? It can't, it, 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 it's not about ignoring the pain just for the sake of joy, but it's also not about holding the pain to the point where you have no joy in it. So that, and again, this is my life. Whatever parts of those are meaningful for you and resonate for you, you'll figure that out for yourself. And I remember reading in Shonda Rhimes' book, uh, The Year of Yes, or Say Yes. I can't remember what the name of it is. We'll have it in the we'll have it in the source notes. But what I remember is when she is saying yes to something that just is all consuming, you can bet, don't idolize me for that part. Like we do in some ways, she's so impressive for all the work that she had out there from Grey's Anatomy and all the other things that she was doing, including being a national best-selling author. But she said that there's an element of my life that's not being taken care of if 
I am consumed by something that has taken my yes and has taken my time. There is something in my life that's out of balance. And I feel that immensely. The reason why you're, you know, the house is still under, uh, under construction from the flood. And I'm in my uh, kitchen right now. And I have this blurred out because behind me is complete chaos for me to have this time to batch the recordings for the podcast means I'm going to have to let some things go. And maybe by tonight, I'll get to the laundry and, and things like that. Again, this is my story. It's not to say my way is right, but it's it, it it's also to say, sometimes we pick up something that is, consumes our time. And is that for a season? And hopefully it is so that we can get back into balance and say, how do we, how do we take all the nuances that, of who we are and bring them back into a balance for a life that's not only feels like we're living it well, we're nurturing it well, we're serving it well. And I think that's even harder for those of us who deconstructed from our Christianity because we're taught this selfless selfless existence that we have to give all that we have to the good of the Lord. We have to give all that we have to the church. Any free time goes that way. There's nothing else that matters out there. And I think that's what sometimes when we awaken to the pain of the world, it can feel a little overwhelming because our focus was on salvation, turning others to Christ and looking at what the needs of the church were. And it was not uncommon for those of us who really believed that, that we were at the church seven days a week, that we had church, we had keys to every church room, that we were involved in every committee, because we believed that if there was a need, we were there to, to serve it. And now to have permission to come back, it's easy to dive into one other element and say, oh, that will relieve me of this guilt that I'm feeling that I have the right to, to hold the tension between what, how I can serve and the joy in, in my life and how I need to restore myself. This tension, living in this tension is actually a sacred place and you deserve to, for yourself to figure out what that is. Now, that was kind of a tangent here as I, I tend to do sometimes. Um, but, you know, I talk a little bit about in the blog, I talk a little bit about uh, how sometimes I do get, I, I will get a little irked when I hear things like a trophy costs $2.5 million that, uh, that, so the trophy for the Fiesta Bowl, this in 2022 costs $2.5 million, $2.5 million. What, what are we doing? That's a college, that's a college football game. What are we doing? Do you know what that money could do? Our priorities are messed up. Sure, I can sit there and crochet and and drink a glass of wine and watch the game and still enjoy it. But in the back of my mind, I'm going, no, we are going the wrong way here. We should not have to have it for the joy, for the pure joy of playing the game and being noticed for, for potential pro prospects. They don't need the trophy to cost $2.5 million. So when are we going to start waking up to some of these things? So am I going to get up and start calling and advocating? No, there's a lot of things like that, that I'm not going to make a video about, and I'm not going to criticize because I try to keep my platform on the social justice issues that I'm informed on and also helping you on the spiritual, but not religious path, heal from, de de uh, heal from religious trauma and help you deconstruct your faith. But there are times when you go, I hope somebody picks that one up, pick up that cause and find out, is there a way that the, it can cost a couple hundred dollars? Because the school's going to be just as proud of it. And we can take that $2 million and go solve a, a human crisis. Doesn't that make more sense? Isn't that how we can learn that the, the, this human uh, experience of enjoying football and understanding that watching the, these athletes at the peak of their performance, enjoy that game, but also give something back to the communities, the people who can't afford to even watch the game, who people who, for whatever 
wrong left turn in their lives who probably are just as bet, as good at athletes as those on the field, but didn't get the same chances but simply because of a, by the, their lot in life or their circumstances didn't allow them the opportunity to play college ball. Can we do something like that? Isn't it time? So yeah, I did it again. Did, now, would I bring that up in the middle of a, a party? I don't know. Maybe I would. I try not to though. Maybe I can. <laughs> so yes, like I said, I do have I do have those kind of triggers that show up that could make me uh could make all of us be our armchair quarterbacks. And if you don't know what that means, that just means that someone who is who is quick to criticize or give advice on a situation from a position of safety, from a position of comfort. I'm not going to get out of this chair to do anything about it, but I'm going to complain about it. I'm going to bitch about it. And what, so what does that mean for you when it comes to what we're criticizing and what we are activating to do? Now you might think, what does this have to do with anything that, that this podcast is entitled? The podcast is entitled, it doesn't have to be this way. Now, when I start to write my blogs, and I think I've told you this before, when I start to write my blogs. Oftentimes, I don't know where the writing is going to end. And I thought this was going to end up talking about how over time, humanity takes a left turn. And I'm not talking right, left politics. I'm just using that as a, as a metaphor. Uh, and we go wrong where we do in the world wars, where we weren't paying attention and all of a sudden fascism and terrorism shows up in Germany that really threatened world order. And it took the entire world, including enemies like Russia and America, working together to annihilate it. That's a that's a wrong turn in humanity because we had choices and we didn't make them. So the world had to come together and make it right. And there have been times in our pasts where we have made those choices, where we're still fighting those systems of oppression, which is why even though we have a constitution that says, quote, all men are created equal. Well, no one, no one denies the fact, no one's arguing the fact that the men who wrote all men are created equal were certainly talking about all white men are created equal. There's no denying that that's what they meant. But over time, as our awareness changes and the choices we make changes, and we understand that human rights equal our spirituality, which mean that uh, women, black, indigenous, and people of color, LBG, LGBTQIA+, everyone deserves the same rights. But we have to def redefine what those words mean as we move to a new level of consciousness, as we shift back towards our humanity to say Okay, we didn't, that language isn't expansive enough. And now we understand how limiting it is and how oppressive it is. So we need to change that. And I thought that that's where this entire thing would go, but that's not what showed up. And that's okay. So I'm going to circle back now to say that as at the beginning of this, I talked about empathy. And I want to, I want to talk a little bit about this before I close this out, because I want to make sure that you understand what it is and how at these places where we've made the wrong turn, empathy completely goes out the window. You have to completely be not only disconnected, you have to fully reject empathy to be able to make some of the choices that have been made throughout history where you can justify genocide, the annihilation of people, denying people equal rights based on what they believe, the color of their skin, who they love, where they were born, all of that is a detachment from empathy. Because you can't understand, you somehow have devalued another person based on those values that you somehow feel that yours are superior to them. That is a detachment from empathy. No matter, I don't care whatever else those people have done in the world, that detachment is part of their legacy. So that's why two things can be true. When you talk about uh, Andrew Jackson, like I said, he might've been, there might've been some good things he, he did as president, but he was a cruel, 
inhumane human being who tricked the Native Americans into believing that they were going to be safe and left alone in their homelands. And you have to understand that. So he might have had some aspects of his leadership that could have actually been good for the country, but this is his defining legacy. And it shows that he had no connection to empathy whatsoever. I don't want to hear if he was a good father or any of that. The fact that he was able to bring this level of cruelty to the highest office in our nation shows that that level detachment of, of empathy is how he'll be remembered. I think that's how he should be remembered. And that's for all of us to understand why empathy is so important for us. So when people say, oh, I'm an empath, we're all empaths. It's not something special. Some of us may carry it differently. Some of us may be more aware. Some of us may be more connected, depending on the kind of spiritual work and contemplative work or our callings, whatever you want to get it. I get that. But you don't get a pass about anything because all of your showing is when you are judging, you are connect, you are disconnected from your empathy, from your ability to understand what it may feel like for someone else to not have the same human experience as you give yourself. So we need to, we need to stop that language that says that somehow empaths are special people in our world. We're not. We need everybody to be empaths. We need everybody reconnected to that part of themselves. So what is empathy? It's the ability to understand and share the feelings of others. It is that simple. That's why I said there's nothing special about being an empath. You're either connected to it. You're either, you're either turned towards it or you're not. And sure, it can, it can ebb and flow, but that's, that's what it is. So we are wired for it. It's an innate ability that we all have. Can we pick up, can some people become more um, prone to pick up the emotional cues of other people? Sure, they can. Can traumatic experiences from your past help you pick up those emotional cues from other people? Sure, it can. A lot of studies about that. So what Im impacts our ability is to be empathic, or some people call it empathetic, but I think the real word is empathic, um, is our, our, our life experiences, our upbringing, our culture, our indoctrinated beliefs, all can impact how connected we are to our empathy. At what level are we allowing our empathy? We can, if we can exclude others, but we just really super uber love on our family, we are a selective empath. So that that's what it means. So um, this is a fundamental aspect of the human nature. It's fundamental. And so when people start to awaken to it, it's hard. I hear people all the time saying that I just want a day of rest. I don't want to hear the news. I don't want to go on TikTok. I don't want to hear politic TikTok. I don't want to, I don't want to hear liberal TikTok. I don't want to hear everything that's going on right now because I can't take it. You know what? Take a break. We all have to, I have to take a break about once a week. I just don't even go on social media because I need a break because I have to be so connected and informed to be able to do the videos that I'm doing that I do have to take a break or I'm going to be coming from a place of complete exhaustion that doesn't help anybody. But it also explains a lot about what you see inside people who are very political, who want to pretend to be empaths and who aren't because someone behind the scene, scenes is motivating them. So you're seeing that a lot inside politics. And so the key here is, and I think what you're starting to see happen is that we're starting to find a shift of people who are more connected to their empathy, that are expecting accountability from our politicians who are not. And that is a big, big change 
for us. And I think you see that, especially as the newer generation, the newer, the younger generations are coming up that, you know, I think I, I've said this before, I'm a boomer and we are certainly the problem generation, if you want to say anything, because so many of us are still alive. So many of us are still in politics. So many of us are still trying as best as we can to hold on to that Christian national and Christian nationalism ideology for the sake of white dominion, uh, dominionism. So we're trying to hold on to that and not a lot of boomers are working as, as much as they should in connecting to their empathy so that we can leave this world a better place and then then they found it. Instead, they're looking at holding on to this thought and thinking it's that their God-given right to hold on to this white supremacist thought. Now, you can look at this too. People cringe when they hear you talk about white supremacy. And I want to tell you something, that white supremacy is far broader than just say, calling someone a racist. White supremacy is an ideology about protecting white dominionism so that the white Christian male is in power. So that's not, that is not just being racist. It's being sexist. It's being xenophobic. It's being homophobic and transphobic. It's not because the only person that you think has the right to power and that every, their entire need should be at the top of the of the food chain, if you will, is the white Christian male. Because it's been that way so long, the thought of anything else is terrifying to them. The thought of that. So this is what this tension that they're feeling is because people are done with it. So Gen Xers were really the first to, to start falling away from the parenting of their boomers. I'm at fault here too. And they raised uh, a lot of people who are now part of this movement. The millennials became the teachers. Uh, the Gen Zers and the Gen Alphas are done with it, are done with it. And they're informed and they're educated and they're powerful and they're not afraid to use their voice. But for those of us who weren't who were born, excuse me, who were born. Oh my goodness. Let, let me try that again. Who were born <clears throat> thinking that our voice didn't matter, that our voice was only as good as it was when we advanced our theology. But anything else we weren't supposed to have an opinion on. So we're still trying to find it and using platforms like this, the things that we teach you here, the things that we teach you on our social media, those that you follow, they will help you use your voice. They will help you find your, your grounding and your influence ways that you can use what you have now, because I'm not going to get into those tangible ways, but um, there are people, you can follow them. You can see the people that I follow on TikTok and learn to be informed about ways that you can use your voice because that's getting back to your empathy. That's connecting to your empathy. That is what gives me hope. This is why it's important that when each time that we have choices in our lives, when we're, especially when we're triggered, because one of the most triggered people right now, when it comes to the transphobic conversation, now I'm not saying it's, it's, it's all of us, but the white cisgender woman is triggered by the trans women because they're offended by uh, be, we we are often labeled cis women so that we're identified as we identify with the gender of our birth. They're offended by that. So they can be the most liberal people and still be offended by that. That is a cue of a place where a woman is being invited to connect at a deeper level with her empathy. If she can't see the fact that I'm adding a tiny little adjective to the front of who I am, to allow this table of humanity that I'm not the gatekeeper of. We've just kicked everybody away from it. And we're not comfortable with the crowd here. 
So we get, we still think that somehow we are the keeper of the rules and you can say how much you, you hate MAGA and you can say how much you're going to work against DeSantis and you can be, you can attend every gay pride parade because you are so woke and still be upset by that is where you are being invited into your next level of indoctrinated beliefs. It's, it's where you are being invited to understand that empathy is knocking at your door and you're not fully there yet because beloved, you are not the gatekeeper. You are not the gatekeeper of this table. We just thought we were. So get your, get your coat out of the other one purse, get your backpack out, out of one chair, get your backpack out of the other, because those chairs are not yours, honey. They belong to humanity and it's not going to hurt you at all to sit beside a trans woman and learn about another person's journey because it's fabulous and how brave they must be to finally step fully into their authenticity and say, I am here. Will you celebrate with me? And I'm going to grab their hands and say, I sure am. I am a cis woman and I am your best friend. Come sit beside me. I'll celebrate with you. Because it doesn't have to be the other way. If we choose differently. Ooh, blessed be on that one. All right, beloveds. I am so honored that you are here. I want to say one other thing to you about this. Empathy is your humanity and your humanity is your spirituality. It's a triangle. I see this beautiful, sparkly, unicornish triangle and you can be a part of it. It's inviting you to dance. Okay, thank you for listening, beloved. You can watch the uncut version of today's episode on my YouTube channel, Spirituality Matter Matters with Rev Carla. So you can also connect with me on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok and on my website at revcarla.com. Okay, beloveds, I am honored to be in this space with you. Go in peace and be at peace. Go in love and may you be loved. Go and know that others are on this journey with you. You are not alone. You are seen and deeply and unconditionally loved just the way you are. Blessings on your week and I'll see you soon. Bye for now.